There's kind of a contradiction here, as there always is with U.S. policy toward China. But I'm sure you've heard of the Micron tech scandal, China essentially uh, ending its partnership with this U.S. chip industry company. And you've been hearing a lot about it. I think a lot of propaganda about it, that it's just a tit for tat. In fact, it is not just a tit for tat. There was a national investigation into Micron and it was found, and I don't think this is a coincidence, it was found to place China at a national security risk. And this is not surprising given other information that's come out from cybersecurity investigators in China about U.S. meddling in the tech industry as a whole. So in China, there's already an increased concern about what U.S.-based tech firms are doing in China to undermine national security. But of course, we cannot also exclude the fact that the United States has been imposing export bans on semiconductor technology to China and placing pressure on countries like South Korea, among others, to restrict their exports to China. And of course, this is all very counterproductive, not just for the United States, which cannot really make up for what China can produce. The United States cannot replace China's semiconductor manufacturing industry. Actually, much of the technology produced in South Korea and other places and the United States goes to China to then be manufactured into the goods that the semiconductors are needed for. So to try to decouple from China in this way is extremely, I mean, just ludicrous and uh, just completely antithetical to the interests, not just of the world, but including the United States, right? It's another classic example of shooting oneself in the foot. So you have this news. You also have the G7 escalating with China and their joint communique and all of the remarks that they made especially the UK's Rishi Sunak being the most aggressive in this realm. And you have this contradiction of Joe Biden saying that he sees, and the New York Times reported on this, and, and the, the, the Western corporate media is very skeptical. You have the, uh, the New York Times reporting that Biden is seeing a thaw, right? So there's this idea that the United States is going to thaw relations with China, even as he rallies the countries against Beijing. And so during the G7 meeting that just wrapped up, he forged a consensus, Biden did, toward China, despite tensions between the major powers over their approach. So, of course, David Sanger here, popular New York Times columnist in geopolitical affairs, was a, a huge proponent of Iraq weapons of mass destruction and promoting those lies. But here you have Mr. Biden Joe Biden, this neocon, saying Sunday that there's a coming relation, thaw in relations in both sides moving beyond what he called a silly Chinese act of sending a giant surveillance balloon over the United States. I think the more silly thing here is that the Biden administration spent a week wondering what to do about a weather balloon in the air and eventually shooting it down. I think that was the real silly thing and actually spending, I believe it was millions of dollars in that very absurd operation. I think that's more silly than a, a balloon that happened to go off course and then be called a spy balloon. So it's too far, far too early, they say, whether the president's optimism is based on quiet signals he's received behind the scenes with meetings with the Chinese government in recent weeks. I mean, this is really fool's gold, right? Because it hasn't, it's not like China is very secretive about its desire to have normal relations with the United States. It basically brings this up all the time. Hey, let's cooperate. Let's work together. And I'm sure that's what Chinese officials are bringing to any meeting with the United States. Why wouldn't they? That, see, unlike the United States, which likes to shoot itself in the foot, China generally likes to emphasize its prosperity and economic growth. And it's not going to let what really is silly U.S foreign policy get in the way of that. So Mr. Biden, Joe Biden's own aide, see a struggle underway in China between factions that want to restart the economic relationship with the United States and a far more powerful group 
that aligns with Xi Jinping's emphasis on national security over economic growth. Oh, so now Xi Jinping, despite China's 4.5% growth in quarter one of 2023, is de-emphasizing economic growth for national security. This is just pure project, projection. And so what the New York Times is saying is they're, they're already sabotaging Biden's very lukewarm, milk toast words. They're saying if he's right, Joe Biden, it may take a while for the ice to melt. And facing a new set of unified principles for major Western allies in Japan on how to protect their supply chains and key technology from China, contained in the joint communique, China has erupted in outrage. So, so China is the problem here, as you can see. Beijing announced what it portrayed as a cabal seeking to isolate and weaken, weaken Chinese power. The Japanese ambassador to Beijing was called in and in for a reaming out, and China moved to ban products from Micron Technology, an American chip maker on the grounds that its products pose a security risk to the Chinese public. It seemed exactly like the kind of economic coercion the world leaders had just vowed to resist. So again, and I'm not even going to read the rest of this article because there's other media that needs to be paid attention to on this issue. But here you have the classic projection, the United States in the G7 saying, oh, look, look at that coercion. But what do you think has spurred on this? It's the export bans. It's the sanctions. The United States has a long blacklist of Chinese tech companies that they literally spend a lot of energy and effort getting other countries, other companies, and U.S. investors to not do business with. You can't get a Huawei phone in the United States because they are banned. You cannot purchase one. I mean, you can get one through other means, but you're not going to be able to find them in your, you know, whatever vendor you're trying to go through. You're not going to be able to get them. And that's because the United States is employing economic coercion around the world against China. It's not chicken or the egg. It is the United States is the chicken and the egg. Right? It is the one laying and producing all of this red meat warmongering via economic means. So even Politico, right? all of the Western mainstream media right now is talking about how Biden's so-called um, thaw that he's talking about is likely not going to occur. So uh, Politico, and I have no idea why, it is not showing up, but Politico, here we go, says U.S.-China relationship are showing few signs of thaw, the thaw that Biden was talking about. New tensions have arisen right before an, un, right before an expected high-level meetings or high-level meetings between U.S. and Chinese officials. So Politico says the United States has for months said that it has wanted to thaw an icy diplomatic relationship with China. New tension points keep getting in the way. Well, the United States says it wants to thaw relations with China, but though these tension points are U.S. policy itself. It's the neocons unable to control themselves. And so as the U.S. advance of trade talks with Taiwan made public last week and China's recent ban of memory chips from a U.S.-based company and its infrastructure projects are latest frictions rolling ties between the two economic powers. The disruptions came right before an expected meeting between the Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo and Chinese Commerce Minister Wang Wentao in Washington on Thursday. Wang is also expected to sit down with U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai on the sidelines of a gathering of trade officials in Detroit, although that meeting has not yet been confirmed. We, want to, we still want to have these conversations, said John Kirby, White House National Security Spokesperson. We're still in discussions with the PRC about how to move forward on that, but I just don't have an update for you. And notice how the Western mainstream media calls China the PRC. I want to just let you know what that really means. What they are saying is that the People's Republic of China is the government of China. And by, uh, by labeling and constantly referring to China as the PRC, what they're saying is that that's contested. So just like you had the Assad government or the Assadist regime or whatever, or, you know, you've had these examples over the course of the years, right, where Libya, Syria, these countries were referred to either by their leaders' names or by their government's names. It was to reject the notion that these governments are legitimate. And given that the question of Taiwan 
is really about China's red line of Taiwan separatism being the catalyst of a potential war between the U.S. and China, you see exactly where these U.S. neocon national security officials are going. They are basically legitimizing Taiwan, quote unquote, independence every time they refer to China as the PRC. They're referring to a government, not a nation. So the U.S. says it wants to speak to the Chinese side while seeking to suppress China through all means possible. Is there any sincere sincerity in and significance of any communication like this, said Chinese Foreign Minister Mao Ning last week? I mean, where's the lies there? That's exactly true. <laughs> it's exactly true. How could you? It's, it's like the Minsk Accords. How could you really rely on what the U.S. says when what the U.S. says in actual agreements really doesn't mean anything? They just violate it over and over and over again. So the uncertainty ahead of these meetings underscores difficulty in repairing the U.S.-China relationship, which has hit its lowest point in decades after a string of economic and security flare-ups, they call it. The Biden administration's more conciliatory rhetoric in recent months, emphasizing it doesn't aim to curb Beijing's growth or decouple the two economies, has done little to ease simmering distrust in both capitals. The domestic political pressure continues to drive saber rattling on both sides. The dearth of high-level dialogue is only likely to feed the conflicts. These tensions spilled into plain view last week when the Chinese embassy announced Wang would travel to the U.S. and meet with U.S. trade officials this week. Less than two hours after that pronouncement, Tai announced the U.S. had completed its first phase of a trade deal with Taiwan, which China views as a breakaway province. So the United States is making legitimate relations with Taiwan, which is China's red line. Do not treat Taiwan like an independent country. The U.N. doesn't. Your own joint communications don't, and yet your behavior is saying something exactly differently. So this is exactly why Beijing is irate. Why wouldn't China be irate? It's as if China, imagine if China were to establish independent relations with Puerto, with uh, uh, not even Puerto Rico, because I think that's not the best example, but let's say Hawaii or let's say Texas or any other dispute i mean these are disputed territories right because texas has its own certain kind of political independence uh views right and, and hawaii i mean was a colony and it basically stolen from the people of that um you know of that land and usurped and and made into a u.s state so imagine if china started to do that or california right with all the liberals or i don't even know what they call themselves liberals california is very strange politics i'll just put that out there so even these lines are very blurred in California, but there is a so-called California independence uh, worldview. And imagine if China said, well, let me just work with California. Let me go off the coast of California and put my warships. Let me uh, build an independent trade relationship that negates Washington's rules. What do you think the United States would do? So China has accused Washington of violating the longstanding One China policy in which the U.S. does not maintain formal diplomatic relations with the self-governing island. A Chinese official author unauthorized to speak to the press seemed to walk back the announcement of the meeting shortly after the news of the Taiwan deal, saying both sides are still discussing the details at the working level. So the meetings with Romano and Tai would open the door for the U.S. and China to address mounting frustrations on bilateral trade, reminding, let me remind you all that there's still a trade war on China. This is what China's talking about. It doesn't want these U.S. tariffs and export controls it considers unjustified and protectionist. While the U.S. argues that Beijing, China, continues to engage in forced labor, economic coercion, and other practices that distort the market in its favor. China has also not fulfilled its purchase commitments under a Trump-era trade deal, but the Biden administration's attempt to enforce those terms hit a dead end. The expected meetings could build on an initial meeting created by National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan in a two-day confab with China's top diplomat Wang Yi in Vienna earlier this month, which was described as very substantive, constructive, and candid. But they, you know, Joe Biden has met, but then there's been all sorts of tensions. I don't have to get into all of them. The big one here, though, is this move by China, right? Banning the use of memory chips made by Boise, Idaho-based Micron in a key infrastructures because of national security concern. So this announcement from the PRC, not China, right? The PRC on Micron is just baseless. No foundation, in fact, whatsoever, said Kirby, that the administration is engaging in directly with China to detail its position and see clarity on the move. 
So Kirby is also saying it was an obvious effort by China to push back against a united position taken by G7 leaders against China's so-called economic coercion at the G7. So again, they're framing it as tit for tat. But I want to show you the Chinese position here because oftentimes the Chinese position is looked at as not legitimate. But I got to say, given what I've covered here on this channel, given what the United States has done all around the world, China, I mean, uh, the United States literally brought down Syria's entire internet system during the early phase of that dirty war. Uh, the United States has infiltrated and look in Israel, the topic of the interview portion here. Um, all of them have infiltrated tech industries to essentially undermine the sovereignty of countries that they target. This is the reality of the situation. It has been like this for quite some time. And everyone in the collective West should have a relationship to this problem, given that their governments are doing the same to them. So it's really, imp it's really important to make that connection because it seems like what they're trying to do, the collective West, the United States, is claim that China has nothing to fear, that it's baseless. But here's what the Global Times had to say about this issue. And I find this interesting. It's a Global Times op-ed, uh, editorial, I should say, and meaning that the Global Times, this is their position, and they're relying heavily upon what the government's position is on this. And it's a very strongly worded article. And if you want to hear the Chinese side kind of almost unrestrained, uncensored, go to the Global Times and read their responses to U.S. moves like this. Uh, Alexander Mercurius often references them because they are important to understand how they're framing. And look at this, biting back at China over Micron will break the U.S.'s teeth. <laughs> I mean, this is very clear for, for China. The news that Micron's products sold in China did not pass a network security review has caused a strong reaction in the U.S. This indirectly shows China's decision has touched some Americans, demonstrating its power in producing additional effects. However, the true nature of the matter cannot be covered up by the United States. A U.S. Commerce Department spokesperson said in a statement that this was a raid and attack on U.S. companies that have no basis in fact and would lead to distortions in the memory chip market. This is Washington's consistent use of strong words to justify its actions. Um, in fact, these words are just phrases used to describe U.S. actions of undermining free trade in recent years. China but China is not the U.S. and will not learn bad behaviors from Washington. So this conclusion, banning Micron, was made after a seven-week investigation by China's General Administration of Customs in a network security review conducted by China's Cybersecurity Review Office. So the government, the government body that is committed to this issue. And the review found that Micron's products have serious network security risks, which pose significant security risks to China's critical information infrastructure supply chain and affect China's national security. According to laws and regulations, such as the cybersecurity law, operators of critical information infrastructure in China should stop purchasing Micron's products. Besides assessing how much losses China's decision will bring to Micron, the U.S. shows a certain degree of unease and insecurity, feeling that the quote-unquote blast radius of this matter may be much larger, end quote. This is mainly because they have done many unscrupulous things to China and are very clear about what it means for the U.S. to attack Chinese companies under the guise of national security. They reflexively, they project that any ch action taken by China toward U.S. companies is retaliation. So what China is saying here is, well, we called your bluff. We're not going to be pushed around by you. Do you think we need your products? Do you think you're 100% uh, uh infallible that you are relied upon. And this is the thing. Every time the United States talks about another country's moves, deciding to become more sovereign and independent from potential U.S. meddling, it's always framed as some kind of egregious act against freedom. When in fact, China is trying to gain more freedom from the potential dangers that U.S. tech really does, um, you know, really does come with. <laughs> These are real uh, concerns. Of course, it's not a bad thing to make those who harm China's interests feel uneasy, and it's a punishment they deserve. So again, the United States, you did this to yourself. You deserve it. We don't, what, what obligation does China have to the United States when the United States treats it as such? The Micron case is indeed the first time that this uh, 
office has conducted a review of a foreign company, but Micron is not the first company to undergo a security review by the office. The so-called targeting of foreign companies is simply not true. The only thing it shows with the gradual improvement of China's regulatory system, all market entities must comply with Chinese laws and their business activities. This is not about targeting specific companies, and there will be no discrimination based on the different identities of the enterprise. Neither will anyone be targeted for special treatment. As one of the world's largest manufacturers of semiconductor storage and imaging products, Micron's products in China have long said to have security risks. In addition, Micron has always been known in the industry for its aggressive competitive tactics and has been accused of playing an instigating role in the U.S.'s crackdown on China's technology, as well as being a U.S. company that has dealt the most blows at Chinese tech, Chinese chip enterprises. Micron itself knows clearly whether it has cooperated with Washington to export unsafe products to China, and this will undoubtedly determine its future in the Chinese market. So what they're saying, without actually accusing up front, right, and saying, you know, you've done really nefarious things, they're saying we've known you to do nefarious things with this company. We know, first of all, that there already is a tech war that you're waging on us. And this is us taking measures to protect ourselves from it. And I think that's perfectly reasonable. Uh, how can we cry for Micron Tech when the United States, which subsidizes BACs and is obviously defending Micron, is doing all of this to China? How can we cry? I mean, this is what's to be expected as this goes on and on. So many foreign media outlets have included this matter in the scope of a U.S.-China tech war, suggesting it could lead to an escalation of this war. On the surface, it may seem that way. In the past, the U.S. always took the initiative to strike in the semiconductor field. While China was constrained um, in subjects to others' control, now China has taken actions against Micron, demonstrating its ability to fight back. However, it needs to be said that the reality is not so. The so-called national security of the U.S. is a unilateral and anti-market suppression of China's technology, while China's security review of Micron is to effectively safeguard its own security interests. The nature of the two is completely different. Washington's accusations against China can only expose its hypo hypo hypocritical double standards. So, I mean, that's that's what else is there to say in, in this regard? I mean, that's the reality. The reality is, is that it's the U.S. side playing a tech war, waging one, playing at one, trying their best to isolate and contain China's tech. Hasn't really worked, and I'll show you why. But... This is the reality. The right is China now is able to defend itself. And it wouldn't make such a big move if it was going to damage China's economy. It obviously is not going to. So, in fact, it has long been clear to the world who's engaging in unreasonable suspicion and distorting the market. When China just reviewed Micron, the White House demanded South Korea prohibit South Korean chip manufacturers from fulfilling a gap left by Micron in the Chinese markets. That's how domineering it is. Over the years, facing Washington's small yard, high fence strategy, and its push for decoupling, China has consistently adhered to a high level of openness and support an open and inclusive economic order. This has a considerable extent offset the negative impact caused by Washington and greatly stabilized the supply chains and industries worldwide. So that's true. <laughs> I mean, it's not as if foreign investment, it's not as if relationships around the world have actually declined for China. On the contrary, China is making more robust and better friendships with nations around the world the more and more the United States tries to sour relationship the relationship with China. This is just, I mean, this is just logical. <laughs> this is just what's going to happen when you do these sort of actions. And so they talk about the suppression of Huawei, Huawei and its attempt to acquire TikTok. It's reached an extreme, the U.S., in trampling on the rules of free trade and fair competition. A legitimate necessary action taken by China is used by the U.S. to turn around and bite back, indicative of their guilty conscience and unreasonableness. They must be kicked in the teeth and be made to weigh the consequences carefully. Kicked in the teeth. And so the content here is even probably less important than the way that this is framed. This is a very, very, very clear and honestly, antagonistic response to what the United States has decided to do with regard to my with regard to 
China's banning of micron technology, of micron semiconductor uh, chip exports. And you can call it tit for tat if you want, but that gets in the way of who exactly is the perpetrator of coercion, of uh, you know economic coercion, of these unfair actions on supply chains and damaging the economy. It's the United States. The United States is the one destroying supply chains. It's the one that's causing economic instability. Uh, why would countries all over the world sign on to the Belt and Road Initiative otherwise? <laughs> and it's because China actually offers stability. China's economic growth in quarter one, despite all of this, despite all of these attacks, should be telling. And it's not as if these moves by the United States don't have consequences. The, the chip export ban, the sanctions on all these companies, it does have an impact and it's not a positive one. But what has come out of it has been positive in the sense that China is now able to move in a more sovereign and self-determined direction economically based on both necessity and also with an alignment over its uh, geopolitical interests around the world. This is more aligned, right? Just to be being in the U.S. camp, which was never the case for China. That was always overblown, despite how big the economic partnership was between them. China never put all of its eggs in the U.S. basket. It's just that the United States happens, and it happened to be, especially after the Soviet Union fell, the biggest basket because it had become not just the economic hegemon, right, that uh, was unquestionable after World War II, but then it became the military hegemon in the sense that it was using now its military to ensure in all of the classic neocon documents, Wolfowitz, Doctrine, etc., to ensure that no other power could rise that would serve as an alternative to U.S. unipolar dominance and full-spectrum dominance. So all in all, this is part of, this is all part of that. This is part of China's ascendance and saying that, no, we're not going to be bullied and punished by you. But I want to now show you this is this is earlier, right? This is back in March, but this is the Global Times talking about, and you can find this all across Chinese media, talking about how this tech cooperation will not be hindered by U.S.'s decoupling, that its industry will not be hindered. So it talks about Brazil, right, and its willingness to trade. But um, as you can see, right, uh, they talk about the challenges and they talk about with growing scientific and technological capabilities, China has been actively promoting technological cooperation and exchanges with developing countries. It has established tech cooperation with over 160 countries and regions and signed more than 110 intergovernmental sci tech cooperation agreements. And China's tech achievements, such as high speed railway and space stations, have attracted cooperation interests from countries around the world. So it doesn't matter, right? They're saying that if you advance, this zero sum game that China's scientific and technological progress over the past decade has benefited from the implementation of independent innovation in reform and opening up and from its integration into a global network of scientific and technological cooperation. And this is shown true in the chip industry where China is becoming more and more independent in the manufacturing of its own semiconductors and really putting to the test this idea that if you rip away Taiwan, right? If you cut Taiwan off from the Chinese market and TSMC, it's huge chip making corporation, semiconductor industry. If you do that, then you're going to really uh, just put a noose around China's neck economically and it will be slowed down. China is saying, no, actually, not only do we have robust partnerships with countries around the world, but we all, you know, and, and that's almost all countries around the world. It, including many of which are China, you know, number China is their number one trading partner, but we can also do it ourselves. And so you'll see all over Chinese media, self-reliance, this term self-reliance come up. And so all of this, right, to understand Micron, right, there was some confusion I saw in other programs, like, well, if you're banning exports to China, you know, if you have this export ban on chi to China of semiconductor technology, and China's banning Micron doing business in China, doesn't that just conform to what the U.S. wants anyway? 
it's a little more complicated than that because as you all know, the US does not follow the rules that it sets out for. It wants everyone else to follow them while the US does its own thing because the US is thinking about its own narrow interests. But in the realm of chip production, it becomes this complicated web of, well, which parts, which components, and how do those components fit into how the US wants the supply chain worldwide to look? And how it wants it to look is China cut off as much as possible. And the United States and its allies uh, putting themselves in as a replacement. And there are two problems with that. One, China is so integrated in the high-tech industry all over every single sector within this industry, including semiconductors, you can't really cut it off. You can't cut off China's semiconductor technology manufacturing base from the world. It's impossible. You can't. If you do that to South Korea, South Korea is an economic crisis. If you do that all around the world. And you heard what uh, uh, Michelle, uh, what was her, Michelle Flournoy, right? That neocon hawk told to Seth Moulton, you blow up TSMC in Taiwan, you cause economic crisis. The same goes for if you cut off China from the rest of the world, if you destroy its manufacturing capabilities in the high tech industry, then you destroy the world economy. And of course, uh, the, the, the other problem with the United States doing this is not just that. It's also that the United States and Europe, the collective West, can't replace what China's doing. They can't. They're not going to. They talk, oh, TSMC in Arizona, and we're going to start building chips at home. No, you're not. And the reason why is you hear the, the Apple CEO has said it, and he's gone viral on, I don't know if he's still the CEO of Apple, But he went viral years ago for saying that the United States just doesn't have the talent and the skill, right? It doesn't have it. The reason it doesn't have it is because the U.S. doesn't invest in high technology at an industrial capacity. It doesn't invest in the education required. It doesn't invest in the facilities and the manufacturing capabilities required to do so. Because investors in the United States mainly reside in what industry? Not manufacturing, but in finance. What does what what do financiers what do what does finance want to do? It wants to make more money off of financial transactions, off of credit, off of debt, off of all sorts of other ways in which to produce more money with money. They do not want to lay down money to produce something in partnership with manufacturers that would maybe not yield immediate profits because that's what a lot of um, that's what a lot of manufacturing consists of. You, in order to build something, you've got to lay down capital before you get the profits. I mean, that's just that's just the reality. And finance capital says no, no, no. That's why in California, all that talk about a high speed rail never came to fruition, and it never will because bankers don't want to do it. So when you have a situation like that, you have a, you have a, a, a total austerity across the board, an austerity agenda from both political parties in the United States. You have a situation where the US and Europe, Germany's in economic crisis now and collapse and recession. They don't have the capacity. They don't have the manufacturing capabilities. So they're going to lose. And they've already lost. All of this, tit for tat, whatever whatever it is, China has won this battle because China can be more self-reliant. They invest in this stuff. They will figure a way out They will be fine, even if it hampers economic growth to a certain extent. They'll still be fine. They'll still go ahead. There will not be a crash or collapse. The United States, just look at what happened to Germany. It's coming for them. And the United States is not willing to invest in what's needed to avoid such a thing.